Hi everybody, my name is Eric Fredericks. I'm a assistant professor at Grand Valley State University. And together with myself and Jared Moore, we are excited to present you our work on Search at Home, which is a commercial off-the-shelf environment for investigating optimization problems. And what this really means to us is how do we take some of these really nifty microcomputers that we have either for research or for STEM projects or for playing around with at home, and how do we take them and apply them to our research problems? Basically, how can we use some of our really interesting search algorithms on these constrained devices, and what does it actually imply for our research? So that's what I'm going to discuss with you for the next handful of minutes. Right, so the goals of this project were to basically figure out how to create a framework for in situ research. And what that means to us is that we are taking our devices and we are applying search in the particular situation or operating context or environment in which it would be deployed. So effectively, you have a very low cost, albeit low powered and constrained device doing the actual activities that need to be done in the environment rather than in some kind of a simulation or in some kind of a sandbox. So we're doing it in the real world production environment. Um, and plus, I don't know if anybody of you or any of you out there are like me, but I have a ton of these little devices lying around for class or for fun or for home automation that are just sitting there collecting dust. And my goal is to take them and make them useful. Uh, and it turns out that you just have a ton of computing power, basically at your fingertips for very little entry uh, cost. So my goal was to take them and to use them for actual research. Right. So. A little bit of background and related work on the microcomputing domain. So these tend to be non-production level devices. They're more for hobbyists or makers uh, or STEM uh, education type projects. They tend to be uh, at a very low price point. So for instance, I've got an image here taken from Adafruit where this is the Raspberry Pi Zero. It is a, a very small device and it's only $5 if you just get the board. Uh, no Wi-Fi capabilities on this one. You start adding on components and adding on features, then the cost obviously comes up. But these kinds of devices are great for activities like STEM education or, again, homemaker projects where they are very, very affordable. Now, there are lots of other devices out there as well. Obviously, there's more powerful Raspberry Pis, the newest one being the Pi 4 with, I believe, up to 8 gigabytes of RAM. There is your Arduinos, uh, BeagleBone, and just a ton of other types of devices which are coming out for basically microcomputing. Now, what makes these really interesting is these represent effectively an embedded system. So we actually start introducing real, real world constraints such as dealing with power optimization, right? These can be powered by batteries or they might be consuming energy from your home. How do we reduce the amount of power imparted on a system? We have temperature concerns. If these boards start operating very, very quickly, they may start overheating and then components start shutting down and we see performance really dip. There are memory constraints. Oftentimes these are constrained. The Pi is one of the standouts where it has gigabytes of RAM. Not all of them have that amount of free memory lying around to use. Uh, and with that, there's disk space, right? There are not hard drives typically built into these devices. The Pi has a SD card slot for your hard drive, but a lot of them you actually have to flash your program onto the board. So disk space is a concern. We can't just dump an Electron program on there with all the modules and expect it to work. Uh, and then since we're at this microcomputing level, we also have timing constraints, right? So we have effectively a real-time operating system that we may have to deal with where our programs are operating in such a way that we have to make sure that no collisions are occurring, uh, no collisions are occurring no schedules are being delayed. It, basically, all of your real-world problems are right at the forefront here. Uh, and there are, again, there's a ton of these types of modules, and a lot of researchers are getting excited about using them. We also have the field of online optimization to consider as well. Now, with any optimization technique, there's the notion of no free lunch. That's something that we all probably know about at this point where you are never going to have the perfect algorithm for free. There's always going to be some consideration you have to deal with. Uh, and the interesting thing about 
these microcomputers is that this no free lunch paradigm really is noticeable because you have these constraints that I just talked about in terms of disk space or memory space or overheating or dealing with real-time considerations. Anytime you introduce something very, very fancy, like a runtime search heuristic, you're going to see a, a no very noticeable impact very soon. So working within the boundaries of these systems makes for a very, very interesting research project. Now, there is a ton of work on online optimization that is out there with my short paper. I was not able to really delve very deeply in there. So all of the reviewers have pointed out everything I was missing. I definitely appreciate that, and I'm aware of that. But I at least wanted to cover the highlights for you here. So in terms of in situ optimization, there are techniques for looking at um, optimizing power consumption, for instance. So this first reference here, uh, an integrated linear programming approach was taken to help with the low power systems. Right, so how do we minimize test suite power usage, which is a, a great consideration for real world systems. Uh, there's also using the model predictive control for um, Again, real-world systems, how do we optimize a controller online? Uh, and then last but obviously not least, we have different strategies that are actually looking at the various scenarios that your system can experience um, in terms of a statically configured system or a system that can reconfigure itself at runtime. So again, these are some very high, not high level, but very limited view at the field of online optimization. And if you are interested in this, there's a plethora of work out there. Um, and then one of the other areas that we can also look at as well is there is a, a burgeoning field in using FPGAs. So basically hardware that can reconfigure itself. Uh, genetic algorithms and other forms of evolutionary computation have been applied to these FPGAs. Uh, there are other search heuristics out there as well. But basically taking what we're doing at the software level and really applying it at the hardware level. And this is actually, a, again, a really interesting field of research. In terms of our system, though, we wanted to basically create a, a high level framework for researchers to be using. And initially, we had a slightly different application domain targeted. We were looking at load balancing. Um, I'll, I'll talk about our empirical study in a moment. But Effectively, what we have is a networked system with a point of entry, a number of devices, and a router at the heart of it. So I had a netbook. I had a leftover netbook lying around. So that was my point of entry into the subnet. It was basically the gateway into talking to all my devices. I had a Raspberry Pi 4 with 4 gigs of RAM, and this was the workhorse of the system. I have a handful of Raspberry Pi 3Bs with 1 gigabyte of RAM. Uh, and those were doing some crunching of data on their own. And then I have, again, a leftover Linksys router from probably 15 years ago, where I flashed it with the Tomato firmware. Now, this is an open source firmware for routers. The default Linksys router could not handle the amount of network traffic, and it kept dropping nodes and dropping packets. So I, I use this firmware, and that's basically why it is there. So. The thing to take with this is that the Raspberry Pi 4 and 3, these are all interchangeable. You could drop any device into the system as long as it is network ready and as long as uh, basically it understands how to talk the Ethernet protocol. You could use Bluetooth, you could use whatever communication you prefer, but the point is that with this particular system, we're using Wi-Fi, but there's nothing stopping you from using your own protocol. Uh, and then one of the other considerations here is we really wanted to prove feasibility to make sure that we could even run a GA on a Pi, because again, they're constrained devices. Take this and apply it to an Arduino or a BeagleBone as well. So what we were looking to do here was to take one of the more basic search problems that we have, and that's discovering an ideal string. And what we were looking for is how long it took and is convergence even possible on these devices again initial proof of concept study. And if any of you are interested, we have our source code, our hardware specifications, and our data sets have been made publicly available at the GitHub link that you see right now. This is intended to be a starting point where we have different branches for you know, whichever line of research we're going for. The SSBSE 20 branch is what was performed for, for SSBSE here. Uh, the R script is available as well if anybody's interested in that. 
So the problem that we are looking to solve is we wanted to discover the title of our conference plus the URL as well. So what you can see here is that we have our character set, right? And then we also have some special characters in here as well. So this is not just alphanumeric, it's alphanumeric plus characters. And what this actually is, if you're interested, this is, uh, we're looking for basically ASCII codes between 32 and 64. The string length is 84. Uh, if we apply all of this together, we have 2.7 times 10 to the 126 possible combinations of answers. And for a constrained device, that is a big solution space to search through. Obviously for a, a normal computer or a cloud computing environment, this is a trivial problem, but it's great for proving feasibility. Now our fitness function here is basically what is the difference between the target ASCII value and the optimal ASCII value. So we're basically looking to fill each character as we went along. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of our GA, so we actually pulled a standard GA from a GitHub gist, which is um, usually something I write by hand, but I thought we'd try something open source to, to base it off of. The genome is array-based, so it's basically just a, a Python list. We use single point crossover with a 0 0.5 crossover rate. Uh, and then mutation was actually interesting, single point, but it was automatically applied to every child that was created from crossover. So there is a lot of mutation baked into the system. Selection was simply related to the fitness score. So basically we would rank all our population and select based on that. There wasn't any tournament selection or roulette selection or anything like that. And then for every device, we performed 25 experimental replicates for statistical significance. All right, so in terms of our results, this figure that you're looking at here is the number of generations it took to reach convergence to actually find that string. And what we did, we compared uh, a laptop, so basically a current generation laptop with lots of RAM, with a GPU on it, so basically should run very, very fast. Uh, we also compared it to a Raspberry Pi 4B and the Raspberry Pi 3Bs. And what we found is that convergence took exactly the same amount of generations per between each replicate. So we did the Wilcox and Man Whitney U test to basically establish that with a significance level of 0 0.001. So very, very good in terms of significance, at least in my opinion. So convergence is possible, which is wonderful. On the other side of things, we were looking to see how long this took. And this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Again, this is a very trivial problem. If you step back and think about it, the laptop took very little time to converge. Right, so the execution time was under a thousand seconds. So it looks like we're at about 500 seconds on average. The Raspberry Pi 4 took a little bit longer. The Pi 3 took even longer than that. And we have statistical significance between each of these box plots that you see here. So convergence is possible, but the less power, the less memory your device has available, it takes a little bit longer, which intuitively makes sense. But the point was to prove feasibility here. And where we're going to take this next, again, this was intended to be the start of an experimental test bed for this path of research. We were looking at doing distributed search heuristics, so basically using something like multiprocessing if it's on one device, or the dispy Python package if we're going to do a series of nodes. Dispy is basically cluster computing in a, a small environment. Here we could do things like offload requirements monitoring to our devices, so basically make them agent-based handle our software engineering implications that way, perform fitness in a distributed fashion, and then bring everything back together towards the end. Uh, we might also look at production concerns. So basically, how does search actually interact in the real world environment, right? Is this even possible to run without expressing a different behavior? Maybe tweaking some of our software artifacts at runtime and seeing how the systems react to that. Uh, so basically, how does that real world implication impact our system? And then last, but certainly not least, how do we handle power concerns, right? If we're deploying this in a smart home or if we're deploying it in you know, a home environment, we wanna obviously keep costs down or extend battery life or something of that nature. So how do we bring power consumption to be a first-class citizen in the software artifact scheme of things, right? Do we model it as a non-functional requirement where it directly impacts our algorithms, bring search in to optimize it? So there's lots of different things we can do with this. Uh, so to conclude here, Search at Home is our open source framework for performing the research that I've mentioned. We targeted evolutionary computation, but you can run any search algorithm that can run on one of these devices. Again, the Pis run Linux, 
So you can basically run any language you want on those. And feasibility is demonstrated on a search string problem. Obviously, this is an initial step in this path of research. Other than that, I would like to thank our sponsors, the NSF, Oakland University, and Grand Valley, Grand Valley State University. And I will hopefully be giving this talk again in the near future, but thank you all for listening.